Awo, Shalom Rastafari, Shana Toba, Shana Toba, Happy or Good, Good Year, Good Year, Shana Toba, U Metuka, a good and a sweet year. Kativa ve tova. May you be written and sealed for a good year. As well as le alter le chayim le shalom. Which means may you immediately be inscribed and sealed for a good year. And for a good and a peaceful life. These are all some of the traditional greetings or salamtas for this particular fall festival season and this particular Hebraic year, 5772. And we say shalom to all of our brethren and sisterin, and, of course, our mothers of the faith. Now, we've been touching on some of the elements of this particular fall festival season in the Rosh Hashanah, as well as the fact that, more correctly, it will be called the Yom Teruah, or, and, it will be called the Zikaron Teruah. Now, Yom Teruah means the day of the trumpets, the day of the, the blowing of the trumpets. And Zikaron Teruah would be the memorial of the trumpets or the memorial. So this time is really the Feast of Trumpets, while many of the other Hebrews or Jews, mainly the Polish and the, and the Germans, have decided to call it from such a time the Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah, as we've been making it very clear, is not written within scriptures as Rosh Hashanah. And there's some scriptures which point to the Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, which occurs 10 days afterward. And we also touched on these 10 days of awe. The 10 days of awe are known in the Hebrew, the Ibrayist al Kwankwa, as the Yamim Norayim, the, Nami, the Yamim Norayim. Now the Yamim, the days of Norayim are the days of awe. We've connected these ten days of awe with what Revelations chapter 2 verse 10 speaks about this tribulation or being tried for ten days. And we have been bringing together, breaking down that middle wall of partition in the Moshiach in Christ and his kingly character, therefore bringing together the Judaic aspects with the messianic or the Christian aspects to bring it together again because the devil, Satan, and, and his Satanistic minions, especially those in so-called religion, that has kept the real teachings away from the people. And if you have um, listened and seen our previous uh, video, where we actually went into the Yamim or Norayim and went into the scriptures and we pointed out in Revelation chapter 2 where we touched on two of the seven churches, even explaining what these churches really are and what they signify. They signify certain dispensations. And it's in the second church age or Smyrna where we find this trial for ten days. And it is in chapter 2, verse 10. So in chapter 2, verse 10, we have a tribulation for 10 days, which is synonymous with what the Hebrews and the Orthodox and religious Jews know as the Yamin Norayim. So now, this is not a coincidence. This is intentional of our father and of our big brother, the Moshiach, in pointing a word to the wise. So a word to the wise, they say, should be sufficient. Now, as we have gone through this particular teaching on and for the Rosh Hashanah, more correctly, the fall festival season, 
it is important for us to continue with a particular teaching, and let's see if we can bring this back up, um, Psalm 69. You recall in Psalm 69? Psalm 69, for those who might be watching this for the first time or have not seen the previous one, we had touched on that in, in Jewish and, and, and Hebraic thought, Rosh Hashanah, this very day and this very season, since it's for two days, you understand, in modern Judaism is celebrated for two days, is the most important of the judgment day. It's an important judgment day. Now, what does it mean that it's a judgment day? Now, when we read and seek to understand Revelation, we need to understand and comprehend the foundation. Now, the foundation, as Christ says, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. So it's important for us to read and to study and to show ourselves approved. Some believe that all this reading and study of the Bible is superfluous, that all you need to do is have a so-called blind and an ignorant faith. Not so, says the Moshiach. Not so, says our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says and instructs us to study, and he advises us that we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. He didn't say you should believe. It's necessary to have confidence in one's teacher. It's necessary to, to trust the word, but then one must try all spirits. It says to try every spirit because it's false prophets out there. So how are you going to try ones unless you know what the standard is? So let us go forward with this important judgment day on which all the inhabitants of the world pass for judgment before the blameless creator, as sheep also pass for examination before the shepherd. Now, the Talmud, which is the Timherit to us, or the teachings, you understand, the Talmud or the Judaic teachings, they state that in a tract on the Rosh Hashanah, that there are three books of account that are opened on Rosh Hashanah. Now, if you read Revelation, it speaks about, and the books were opened. What context do you think this is to be understood? In an ignorant, Gentile, white, racist sense, which denies the true flesh and the blood of the Messiah, the race of Jesus Christ, out of racism. Out of racism, they deny our black Lord and Savior. As they deny the obvious, then how about in the teaching we must study and show ourselves approved, you understand, for ourselves. Now, the books, the three books that tracked it on Rosh Hashanah says are opened on Rosh Hashanah, on the, the, the Day of Trumpets, on the Yom Teruah, on the Zikaron Teruah, which is the very same day. In Leviticus, it's called the Memorial of Trumpets. And in Numbers, we find it as the Day of Trumpets, or the Day of the Blowing of the Trumpet. It does not specifically state the shofar, but it's understood that the shofar is a very important being the ram's horn that we, in the initial part of this, connected straight out of Egypt with Sobek. Sobek. If you go to the particular significance of this holy day called Rosh Hashanah and the festival of trumpets, the interesting thing you will find is many subjects connected with this. One of the subjects that's connected with this particular day is the binding of Yishak and, and, and the, the would-be sacrifice of Yishak by his father Abraham, that when he was about to sacrifice his son, it is said and written in the narration that an angel, a Melaach, stopped him and stayed Father Abraham's hand and pointed his attention to the thicket. And in the thicket, a ram was caught by its horns in the thicket. Now, that's the obvious that you can read in King James. But then when you go to the Hebrew and you go behind the King James, you find that this particular ram is not just called a ram, but it's called Sobek. And then when you turn to the royal Amharic, 
You also find in the Met of Kedus of Negus and Neges, Kedamawi Halasalashi, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, in his Bible, you also find within them heart the same Sobek. So here, the Hebraic and the Masoretic agrees with the King of Kings. Now, here's the interesting thing. Who wrote that book of Genesis? The one who is credited to be the author was Moshe Musa, our lawgiver. Now, Moshe or Musa, who wrote this Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 22, says that he was learned in the wisdom or the mysteries of the Egypts. So in your Bible, it will have a mistranslation, Egyptians, but more correctly, of the Egypts, because there was more than one Egypt, Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, Mundane Egypt, metaphysical or spiritual Egypt, so forth and so on. Now, it says he was mighty in word and deed. So within both the Masoretic, which is a recession, and within the Ethiopic, which is more original, and within the Amharic of the King of Kings, which is the pure language, that which has been purified for our use in this particular end time. In other words, the half of the story is revealed. We find that this ram is called Sobek. Now, to the brothers and the sisters in Egyptology, you all should be able to fill in a little bit more on this particular, on this particular ram that was known as Sobek and who was Sobek. Now, Sobek is the one who becomes the sacrifice. Now, there's a, there's a beautiful, you could have, uh, in there, there's a beautiful, um, there's a beautiful mystery that's really fulfilled in this. This is why when Moses said, we have to go to worship our God, the Pharaoh said, well, you can do it right here. He said, no, 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 no. If we worship our God in the way that we must worship him, this will be an offense to the Egyptians. Because the Egyptians, you know what it's like? It's like when the Moshiach came and those who were into Judaism and faithful and true, they recognized the Moshiach and still they built on that foundation of Judaism, but they went forward with the revelation. But there were some so-called Jews that refused to accept the Moshiach. So they stayed with the old revelation, but did not move on with the new revelation. The same is true in ancient Egypt concerning the period of time that we know as the Exodus and as Moshe. But the key and significant thing is this particular ram and the connection with the ram's horn. And we hope to go into a little more detail and present some of the findings and conclusions of our reconstruction of ancient Egypt and the Exodus. But in this particular portion right here, we are learning that there are three books of account that are open on the Rosh Hashanah or on the Yom Teruah, the Day of Trumpets, wherein the fate of the wicked, the Kufuach, the righteous, the Tzadikah, and those of an intermediate class, those of a middle class, those of a middle region are recorded. So there's three types. There is the righteous, there is the wicked, and there are those who still are hedging their bets. Now, let's understand this. The names of the Tzadikan, of the righteous, are immediately inscribed in the Book of Life. And they are sealed to live. In other words, they are sealed l'chayim. They are sealed for life. Now, the middle class, spiritually speaking, those who still are hedging their bets, are allowed a respite. They are allowed a reprieve of ten days. These are the ten days of awe that we know Hebraically as the yamim, Norayim, and the ten days of awe begin with the Yom Teruah, which is known as Rosh Hashanah, and the ten days of awe, they end with Yom Kippur. So the middle class 
or allowed a respite from the judgment and this important time of judgment until Yom Kippur in order to repent and to become righteous. Now, this is all from a Judaic perspective. But if you understand it carefully and correctly, it basically reflects what the Moshiach perfects, you know what I'm saying, within the Burt Chadasha, within the Hadith Kidan. Now, the wicked are to be, quote, blotted out of the book of the living. The wicked, after this 10 days of respite, even they have the opportunity to repent because Hashem Baruch Hu, is not willing that any should perish. You understand? But that all should come to repentance. But the wicked who remain wicked are to be blotted out of the book of the Hiyawan, out of the book of the living, according to Psalm 69. And here is where we had left off a little bit earlier in our teaching, and we want to give ones a little bit of a background. And there's a further building up on this when we connect the zodiacal sign. The zodiacal sign for this time is the sign of the scales. It's a sign of Bamarinya, the Mizan. It's the sign of the balance for Tishrei. And now this is claimed to indicate the scales of judgment, balancing the, the meritorious and, and righteous against the wicked acts of the person being judged. So once again, we are getting a word picture out of Egypt from the mishtir or the mystery or the wisdom that our brother Moshe, Musa, our lawgiver, was learned in and was mighty in word and deed. This proved the merit of his gnosis, of his initiation, of his knowledge, you understand, of the way, the truth, and the life. So the taking of an annual inventory of accounts on the Rosh Hashanah or the Yom Teruah, the day of the blowing of trumpets, it was adduced by one rabbi, one rabbi, uh, Nachman ben uh, Yishak, from the passage in Deuteronomy 11 and 12. In your Bibles, it might be 11 and 11 because there's a, there's a one verse difference between the Hebraic scriptures and most of the so-called Gentile Christian scripture, which says that the care of Hashem is directed from, quote, the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. So it's the beginning and the end, or the end and the beginning of a thing that is holy. Now notice this. We have the Shabbat, that's on the seventh day. And then we have the Ihud, which is the first day. And that first day we gather after spending that seventh day in the remembrance and in the rest and keeping it set apart and kedus and holy. So we gather on that first day. And this is not just a Christian thing about Sunday. This is when the Gentiles came in and they call Ehud Sunday. But in our language, as we explained already, and we will explain again, it is Ehud, which is related to Ahad, which means first. So the Shabbat is the seventh day. And Sunday, what's called falsely in the Western Gentile sense, a Gentile misunderstanding and mistranslation, is called Sunday because the Gentiles worshipped their false gods of the sun on that day. But Ethiopically and even Hebraically and from ancient times, so-called Sunday wasn't known as Sunday because they knew the sun came out almost each and every day. They called it the first day. So when you count from the first day to the seventh day, Saturday is the Shabbat. So in our Ethiopic Hebraic witness, the Judeo-Christian culture of Holy and Highland Ethiopia, we see them observing the 
Shabbat, as well as the congregational coming together on the first day of the week. So this is nothing new. We find this also in the Bible as well. So this is a connection that even Rabbi Nachman ben Yishak had made with a passage from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, verse 12, which says that the care of Elohim, Hashem, Baruchu, is directed from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. Therefore, the first of Tishrei, the first of the lunar month of Tishrei, it was considered as the beginning, as the beginning of creation, as the beginning of creation. But let us scroll back for a moment. Let us review, in other words, not go back, for whatever, back, whatever, but let us review. Let us review. You understand? In a sense, let us, in a sense, look in that rear view mirror to see what we've passed. You understand? And perhaps we need to circle around to this again. Psalms 69. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. Now, we've been talking about the teruah. The teruah basically is the trumpet. It's the Hebrew word for trumpet. When we say shofar, we are talking of the kenda meliket. The kenda meliket is the is the horn of the trumpet or the more correctly the ram's horn because there's different kinds of trumpets now when we turn our bibles to this psalm psalm 69 which is actually a very excellent psalm for this particular season let's go to psalm let's write this up here psalm 69 psalm 69 the particular verse that we touched on where it shows there are three classes. There are the sadikan, there are the righteous. Let's write this up here. There are the the sadikan, which is the righteous. Now remember we explained this before, we'll explain this again. For us in the Moshiach, being messianic, we recognize that the Moshiach is our righteousness that that admitting and having subjective faith or admittance in Moshiach in our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and keeping his testimony and the law of God is our righteousness but the key for us is Moshiach the key is Jesus Christos is Yeshua HaMoshiach. So the first class is the Sadiqan, right? The Sadiqan. Now, we should really put the second class are those in the middle. We could call them undecided. Um, we could call them procrastinators. We could call them hedges of bets, hesitators. But let's just call them the middle class. Because there's a lot of talk of the middle class. People are trying to preserve the middle class. Then at the bottom, right, the bottom, we have the wicked. You're saying at the bottom, in the lower class, is the wicked. Now, please don't get it twisted with what's going on in the world, although there is a reflection, and sometimes a reflection may be a reverse image, if you understand what we're saying. But the third class is what we'll call the k Fu, wo, chi. And this equals the wicked. I know as Rastafari will say, um, kill, cramp, and paralyze all weak heart conception. Wipe them out of creation. So the wicked would also be for us as Rastafari and our Targum as Rastafari, our interpretation is the weak hearted. You know what I'm saying? Is is the weak hearted. Now you have the Kufuoch, the wicked, you have the middle class, those of the middle class, the middle of the road, you understand? Know the middle of the road, it's like they're gonna be split. The hypocrites are also the double minded. We can call these the double minded. 
They can see some benefits in being Sadiq Khan, but not enough for them to be Sadiq Khan. They can see some benefits in being Kufuwoj, but not enough for them to be Kufuwoj. So they hedge their bets, the middle class. Now, what we're learning right here is that Rosh Hashanah, or more correctly, the Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, which begins the fall festival season with the blowing of the trumpet, with the blowing of the shofar, is an important judgment day. And this judgment day, on it, three books are open. You understand? And there's three classes of people. And the middle class, see, the righteous, first of all, let's say the righteous. The righteous are immediately inscribed. The righteous are immediately inscribed into the book of life. And this is why one of our traditional greetings or Hebraic greetings at this time would be uh, Ketava or Ketava where Ahatama Toba, which means may you be written and sealed for a good year. And then there is a, another particular greeting that is given, it's le alta le hayim atovim u or we le shalom, which means in the Hebrew, may you immediately be inscribed and sealed for a good year and for a good and a peaceful life. Now, the link with this is revelation. See, when a Christian who does not understand the foundation, like Christ says, you do err not knowing the scriptures. The only scriptures that were scriptures to the Moshiach or to Jesus Christ, if you please, in the time of his incarnation was Torah, was the Nabim and the Ketubim and was the Torah. There was not the four Gospels. There was not the 13 or so epistles of Hawaii Apollos. There was not the book of Revelation or the other epistles of the other disciples turned apostles. None of that existed. That the scriptures, when Christ spoke, when you read Christ in the New Testament, and he speaks about scriptures, haven't you read it written? He is not speaking about New Testament. He is speaking about Belui Kidan or Old Testament. But unfortunately, many of the modern Christians have been deceived by the doctrine of the Nicolaitanes. And we addressed a little bit earlier the Nicolaitanes when we touched on Revelation chapter 2. That Nico, Nico in the Greek means to conquer, and Laos, Laos means the laity of the people. But more correctly, Laos means the unlettered people, the people who were illiterate people who trusted their priests, and what the priests did in this early church age was give them pictures similar to what happened in ancient Egypt, but the people themselves could not read it for themselves. They could not read the ancient scrolls for themselves, but they trusted their priests as a middleman, and then these priests, the assumption of priesthood, it divided the equal when the mamachinet. It divided the equal brotherhood, and that is anti-Christ. Straight up, that is anti-Christ. And we touched on that, and there are verses from Christ and from his own witness that proves that it was never his intention to recreate a priesthood on one side and the laity or the unlettered illiterate folks on the other side and have the priest be as a middleman as it was in the Old Testament and as it became in Egypt, be a middleman. That was not Christ's intention. So when you read about the Nicolaitanes and the Nicolaitans, and he says, the, the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, I hate that the Moshiach hates that. It's something that we ourselves should not get into that, even amongst I and I as Rastafari, as elect Rastafari. We should recognize exactly what Revelation says from the very beginning. And let me remind you, Revelation from the very beginning, it says, it says this in chapter 1 in the salutation of Johannes. It says, um, 
Grace be to you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince, or more correctly, the governor of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests. He has made us. He didn't make some of us kings and priests and the rest of us just regular people, regular folks, but he has made us. After He's washed all of us in his blood. So therefore, all of us are made as a kingdom of the priesthood, as a kingdom of the priesthood to God, to Ha and Elohim, and his father, our father, the father of the house, to him be glory and dominion forever. So this is in first chapter of Revelation, verse 6. Now, when you go to chapter 2 and you get to verse 6, notice this. We go to chapter 2 now and get to verse 6. Hear what in the Red Letter Bibles, Jesus Christos, our black Lord and Savior, is saying. He says, but this thou hast. In other words, after critiquing this first church after the end of the apostolic age, the church of Ephesus, he says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitanes, which I also hate. So he's complimenting this particular church and saying that you also hate the deeds of the Nicolaitanes, but you must define who the Nicolaitanes are. And in a, in a, in a simple way, in a direct way, the Nicolaitanes, is symbolically referring to the earliest notion within the, the early church of a priest class being above or beyond and separated from the so-called laity and keeping the so-called people or the laity in an unlettered and an unlearned state, and therefore giving them pictures, therefore giving them um, um, a lot of other superstition and other things, but not giving them the education that they would need so that they could study and to show themselves approved to God as workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Because if this false priesthood did that, the first thing that the people will find out, just like the slaves did when they started to read the Bible for themselves, the first thing that they will find out is that they were being lied to. You understand? They will find out the truth, the half of the story that wasn't told. So, therefore, this priesthood, as many priesthoods do to keep their power, they have to keep up their spookism, their superstition, their illiteracy and ignorance. They don't, they don't sit and say, well, we're going to teach the word. We're going to deal with the hard questions. You understand? We're going to deal with the real issues. We're not going to sugarcoat anything. We're going to deal with it in blunt and plain reality. They don't do this. They don't do this. Therefore, they are this Nicolaitanes, this assumptive, this assumed priest class that has divided the brotherhood. Christ did not die for the priests and not the people until the people listen to the priests. No. Christ died and resurrected for those who would admit and have faith in him and through his word. And they are to learn his word. This is why when Hermes Trismegistus says that, that um, the sin of the soul is its ignorance. The sin of a soul is in its ignorance. But what counters that is the knowledge. Thus the Moshiach says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free from all of the lies and, 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 and make-believe that these vain teachers, pastors, and preachers have taught. This is why they don't want you to 
read or learn the Bible, and this is why in many of these demon nominations they, that call themselves Christians, they will be like, well, that's not really necessary. All you have to do is clap hands, jump around, and make a bunch of noise, and, and feel. Don't you feel it? It, it, it? It's like an emotional so-called religios or religion, but it's not what the Moshiach or his father, our father, intended. Now, with that being said, because you might just be um, tuning into this for the first time, let's understand that in this particular time that we know as, let's put this up here as well, because this comes under the Rosh HaShana, or more correctly, the Yom Teh Ru Ah. You understand? And this particular psalm, Psalm 69, is an important psalm to consider at this particular point because what we are now learning from the Judaic part of our stolen legacy, the, the Judaic part of our once lost but now found roots. These are the real roots, Rastafari. These are the real roots. Stay tuned for a message and it might be a harsh message, and some might be offended. But let John be true and every man a liar. All right? All right. So in this particular time, we have these three classes, right? We have the, where the fate of the wicked, the righteous, and those in the intermediate um, class are recorded, these three books that are open. Now, the names of the righteous, as we mentioned, are immediately inscribed in the book of life. This is what Revelation speaks on. Revelation is speaking on these same symbolic elements in the same order of arrangement. So it's impossible. This is why most Christians cannot properly interpret Revelation. Not just talking about, oh, what's going to happen next week or next month, but they cannot even understand it in its proper context because they don't know the foundation. They are building their so-called religion or re-lie again, you understand, on shifting sand. This is what Christ said, that those who hear the word, hear what he is teaching, and do it, you understand, is like one who builds a firm house on a firm foundation. But those who hear the word and don't do it is like the fool that built it on sand, and when the rain come and the storms come and the flood come and beat against that house, the one on the sand, it immediately falls. Now, this particular judgment day, the names of the righteous are immediately inscribed in the book of life, and they are sealed to life. And this is one reason why we as Hebrews would say lechayim, and the Jews would say lechayim, lechayim, to life, to life. You understand? Know it's not just to say, see, a lot of folks think that they just say these things and there's no, there's no core meaning. There is a core meaning. There is a core value. You understand? Know saying? And this is what modern so-called Christianities, you know what I'm saying, is lacking, a foundation. You understand? And the foundation is in the Jewish. You call it what you want to call it Hebrew, call it Jewish. In your Bible, Christ himself says that y'all don't know what you're worshiping. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. This is in your Bible now. I think it's um, John, chapter, John chapter 4, if I'm correct. Let's just go there for a moment. John chapter 4. And... It's important because some would say, oh, why are you going into the Old Testament? All that was done away with. That's a lie. That's a lie. They don't know what part was done away with and what part was not done away with. They'll make you believe that everything was done away with. But then whenever they want, they'll go pick and choose. You understand? Some part, like when they want to talk about tithes and, and the prosperity preachers and the rest of it, they'll go back to Old Testament for that, but not for other things. Notice, that's the law too. Here in chapter 4, at verse 22, another 2-2, two, two, at verse 2-2, two, two, Yeshua, 
Jesus, or Jesus, if you please, he says, ye worship, ye know not what. We, I and I, know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And I say to you, that ye know not what you worship, for salvation is of Moa and Bessel, the Imma, Negeta, Yehuda. Salvation is of the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. See Revelation 5, 5. And be a witness. Behold, Kedamawi, Haila, Selase, Siyuma, Egziabia, Negusa, Neges, Ze, Etiopia. Behold, be a witness. Now, with that being said, what about the middle class? Now, as we had said in the teaching on the um, uh, Yamim, the Yamim or Norayim, that the middle class are allowed a respite of 10 days. The middle class is given a respite, a, a time of consideration. These are what, what's called the days of awe, these 10 days. This is similar to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10, which is talking about the 10 days, like the 10 days of awe between the day of trumpets and Yom Kippur and the day of atonement. So now the double-minded and the middle class and those who are hedging their spiritual so-called bets, they're given 10 days. 10 days to do what? 10 days to repent. 10 days to have a change of heart and mind and to become a Sadiqan. In other words, to accept Moshiach, to accept our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, Jehoshua Ha Moshiach, to the glory of Negusa Neges, the King of Kings. Now, the wicked, on the other hand, they are blotted out of the book of the living. When that Yom Kippur or that judgment day comes, and when we look in our Psalm, Psalm 69, verse 28, it says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. This is, this is interesting because it almost brings to mind that, that Yahweh, Baruch Hu, 